Corporate governance issues resulting from bad governance, fraudulent activities, insider abuse, and corp corruption has been one of the major causes of liquidation in the banking industry, both in developing the develop both in developing and developed countries. The issue of poor corporate governance practices made the Central Bank of Nigeria to sack the board of First Bank of Nigeria and FBN Holdings on the 29th of April 2021, followed by management infractions and um, bad credit, which includes bad credit decisions, significant and non-performing loans, uh, according to the Apex Bank, the sweeping of the uh, changes by the board in the executive management without engagement or prior notice uh, was uh, to the regulatory authorities could affect the bank's uh, minority shareholders and the bank's over 31 million customers. After making provisions of various regulations, and uh, uh, regulatory forbearances and liquidity support to reposition the bank. Recall that less than 24 hours after First Bank of Nigeria announced the replacement of uh, Mr. Adishola Adedunton, about eight months to his expiration of his second tenor, the sharp price of FBN holdings dropped 6.7%. Uh, 6% on Thursday. The company's biggest daily fall since January 2021. A lot of talks around this move and what corporate governance means, but to give uh, an insight into this issue and all the developments that have followed, joining us via Skype uh, from Abuja, he is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Global Analytics Consulting and also a former presidential candidate, uh, Mr. Tokpe Fashua. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Fashua, and thank you for your time. We really appreciate this. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tolu. Sorry, uh... I came for a meeting and couldn't rush back to my office, so I'm doing this from the car. All right. My apologies. Oh, okay, then. Uh, let's uh, quickly look at uh, this issue. Uh, particularly, the issues are bad credit decisions and, of course, non-performing insider loans. This is uh, the boardroom politics going too far. How, do you, what, how does this come to you? Well, you know, the, unfortunately, it's not, um, it's not an uncommon uh, a scenario, uh, if I may put it that way, um, and uh, I reckon that it's, it's, it's not only First Bank that's involved in such a uh, situation. Um, as a matter of fact, I realized that there seemed to be some uh, some kind of misunderstanding of uh, of what corporate governance should be. People people tend to relax and forget what it's all about. Uh, the thing is that more and more. Directors, you understand that they will be in trouble if the companies that they are directors in or, or, or the boards of, are, you know, run into trouble. You know, you, you cannot farm it out to the management if you are a, a director of a company. And every corporate governance code, uh, SEC, you know, even recommendations from uh, the financial reporting standards and everything, they make it clear and clearer every day that, uh, that there's a, there's you have to be extremely careful. It's not just about sitting on the board, because what we see is um, normal issue of, uh, of 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 simple uh, moral situations and so on, whereby where people see uh, power and they use it the way they want uh, to make themselves, uh, you know, richer, if you like. You know, now I'm not alleging that this is what has happened in the case of First Bank, and first we're lucky uh, that at least the Central Bank has taken decision quickly to stem any untoward uh, development in, in that bank because it's a systemically important bank, which if anything goes wrong in that bank, is going to cause cataclysm across the industry and even into other sectors of the economy. So it's a great thing that they have made this move and they have stamped their feet on the ground, while uh, the former board uh, you know, will also step up to, to, to try and uh, justify their actions uh, as it were. Hmm. Yeah, in this very instance, uh, the Central Bank has said that, look, we, we are giving you some sort of forbearance, some regulatory forbearance, some liquidity assistance, and they don't see why you should take a decision that affects the CEO of a company without letting them know, which is, which is very valid. The, 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 the anathema is that a cent a, a fa his first bank, uh, given that it's actually the first bank in Nigeria, it started... 1894 thereabout by the elder elder Dempster CEO, you know, would actually go into a situation.
there that it shouldn't have happened. However, now that it has happened, Central Bank has stepped in, the industry is stable, uh, and other issues will be sorted out. And directors should understand that no matter how big you are, uh, you are liable and you are culpable if the companies that you are you're sitting on the board uh, has, uh, you know, significant issues. Now, now, Mr. Uh, Fashua, I want to follow up uh, this way. You are more of a professional when it comes to economics and all of that. Now that uh, the bank has been uh, under the forbearance regime since 2016, I guess, but in their books, this was really not showing uh, because when you look at what we have here, they said uh, all of the reports presented did not have that. And that's like a breach of corporate governance. And it's also affecting their stocks and what set things about the bank. So does it not show that uh, CBN needs to do more in monitoring all of these reports coming from our financial institutions? Well, it's not only Central Bank that needs to do more. Of course, Central Bank needs to do more, like I said. This is not just a case of uh, First Bank alone. Uh, we've seen a certain streak among Nigerian, uh, if you like, quote and unquote, big men and perhaps big women, whereby they, they seem to lord it over the boards that they sit on. Okay, it's my company, it's my company. What we didn't understand was that even in a, in a scenario like uh, First Bank, which is a very big organization, which is uh, not even a, an organization started by a Nigerian, uh, the history of it and so on, even though Nigerians have bought a uh, majority of the shares now, you know, that such a thing would happen uh, or be alleged to have happened in that instance as well. So it's not just a case for Central Bank alone. It's also a case for analysts, you know, uh, ratings agencies and what have you, uh, to be able to de decipher what is going on and to be able to, look, the, the, the 2008-9, um, you know, collapse of financial markets everywhere, especially in developed countries, this was exactly what happened, that the ratings agencies were even rating the bonds that those issues, companies had issued, but they were rating it, and there was, we saw that there was a moral hazard there, whereby because of the fees that they needed to collect, they were not actually telling the truth about the exact situation. In the case of First Bank, uh, the rating agencies are saying, I mean, we have a few of them, we have Augusto and Co., we have Global Rating as well, you know, those are local uh, rating agencies. They're saying that uh, they were not giving some information, but they could have also extrapolated they could have extrapolated. In 2016, what happened was that, you know, um, some, some, some uh, Nigerian organizations had bought some of the um, uh, marginal fields and onshore assets from uh, uh, international oil companies, and the banks financed them massively. You realize there's still that rig sitting down in Marina right now, okay? That rig, or you say, what I mean rig, you know, that was, was, was purchased for millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And banks actually took it, but because uh, the price of crude oil crashed in 2016, the companies, the indigenous companies that bought those assets, they found themselves they were stranded. And then some of them took a walk. The banks actually took the rap. And all of this is created uh, big holes in the, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the balance sheet of these banks. Okay, for the case of First Bank, at some point, First Bank, has, uh, First Bank shares itself was delisted from the exchange, you know, by management decision. And only the first bank holdings. Now, so one other thing that comes up then becomes uh, this idea of holding holding company. Does it shield organizations that are the, you know the very beneficial and the very active organizations that, that they have holding uh, capacity over? Does it does it cause some sort of confusion for the market? Because again, uh, it is valid that people can allege that look, you you have made them bought into an asset without telling them the full story. And lastly, I'll say that, look, regulatory forbearance is difficult to report in, a, in, in the company accounts, okay? It is difficult to report. In fact, I'm, I don't even know how they're going to report regulatory forbearance. And nobody's going to say, look, we, we, we did well this year, but uh, we did well because Central Bank really assisted us so many times. We had to get liquidity for uh, liquidity assistance of Central Bank six, seven times and all of that. They won't tell you. However, it may be something that needs to be incorporated, uh, looked into, and say, okay, how do we report this kind of scenario? So some has even said that central banks should be the one reporting them. No, central bank will not report an organization over which it, uh, that it regulates. No. And remember, this is an SIB. And an SIB means that if anything shakes in that place too badly, the entire industry may go down. And that's the thing. And you don't want to have that. In fact, as we sit here right now, that is the biggest concern now, that this thing must not be allowed to, to exacerbate to the point where uh, we, you know, we have a systemic crisis on our hands.
true. That must not happen for a bank that controls uh, 31 million uh, customers now and deposit base of more than 4 trillion naira. It's, it's, it's worrisome uh, if that happens. Uh, another thing that's that running through my mind is when we look at the aspect of the bad loans and non-performing loans inside that non-performing loans. Do you think we need to have a loan framework that, or regulatory framework that will put our banks or subject them to stress tests with regards to loans time to time? But, you know, but that's the role of the central bank. And even the NDIC does that sometimes because, you know, NDIC insures every depositor in, uh, in, in such a bank. That's an insured bank, okay? Um, and what that means is that everybody's deposit is guaranteed because the bank pays a certain amount uh, to the, the NDIC as an insurance company uh, in the event that such, a, such an you know, issue happens for them. So the NDIC, the Central Bank, those two organizations, at least I know, they take the central, they take their accounts, especially of the banks, through what is called stress testing. And in stress testing, what you're looking at is to say, what if you lose X amount of loans that you have given? Uh, will it affect you so adversely? How adversely will it affect you? Will it affect your, what they call the going constant status? <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, I heard even the central bank statement, uh, you know, talking about a going concern status for First Bank. And I felt that this, the first central bank would not have done what they did except they had seen a lot of red flag, a lot of red lights all over the place. Okay, and, and of course, you know, so I'm, I'm actually uh, uh, in support of that. So the, the public cannot conduct the stress testing. Okay, analysts can conduct it. You know, rating agencies can conduct it. Other organizations in the financial sector may be able to conduct uh, such such stress testing. Okay, there are also all sorts of uh, games that uh, people who are in the financial sector play to disguise the loans and. Uh, classify them in different ways by which uh, the, 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 the audit trail will be lost. But, you know, I must also tell you that the guys, that I know a few guys in Central Bank that are very, very smart and they know how to trace, uh, you know, the, this, these issues, uh, no matter how well the banks try to disguise it. So they do the, uh, that stress testing from time to time. This is just a wake-up call to say that, um, at the end of the day, we must never go, all go to sleep. Uh, remember also that COVID... Um, uh, resulted in people shutting down operations last year. So of course, funny enough, you still see a scenario where Nigerian banks declared all sorts of billions and hundreds of billions and so on. But we, you know, we can't. We, we know by now that we can't rely on many of those numbers because there's a lot of financial engineering and all that involved. In uh, and of course, uh, at some point they started competing on the basis of who was posting the biggest uh, profit, which is not right. Because people will ask you, you are making all this profit. But what has happened to the real sector in Nigeria? In last year, many companies were shut down for five months, for six months. And, and of course, one way or the other, no matter how well you disguise it, it's going to show up in the books of the banks, and that's what we're seeing. But we're hoping that now that things are coming back to normal, um, not only First Bank, but all the other banks will be able to come back to normal. I think, however, that the, 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 the First Bank being the, used to be the biggest bank in Nigeria, at least the first bank in Nigeria, as it is called, uh, but they have seen now that, look, they are not above regulation. And it's not, it could, should never happen that such an organization should be above regulation. As a matter of fact, regulation is what they are profiting from. Regulated industries, uh, you know, and I'm saying this for those who, who always say, deregulate everything, deregulate everything, we don't want regulation. No, regulation is profit, regulation is order, okay? Regu regulation is discipline. Unregulated industries is a scenario where anybody does anything well that they like, and many times they undercut themselves, and then it becomes a race to the bottom, where nobody actually makes profit. Those who are in unregulated industries are suffering. Most of our SMEs are unregulated. They are in unregulated industries. Anybody can go and import the same thing that you are doing. Nobody is stopping anyone. But regulation is what the banking sector relies on to give them the stability, the, 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 the legality and otherwise, you know, to make the monies that they are making. And so nobody that, that's a director of a bank or the chairman of a bank should be above regulation. And I think that's the biggest lesson we have learned uh, from this uh, in Broglie. Indeed, indeed, it's, 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 it's very, very uh, important to note. Now, almost finally, let me let you uh, go. The banks are also exposed to other sectors, uh, particularly with COVID, uh, the oil and gas, some even the energy, focused on energy, electricity, and all of that. How long do you see all of this affecting the stability 
of Nigeria's banking system. Yes, I know lately a rating agency still said, I think we're stable, but what do you make of it with all of these realities that we have on ground? No, well, you know, let me, let me put it this way. A boom is coming, okay? I'm going to write an article on that soon enough. A boom is coming, okay? Even the current edition of the Economist magazine says a boom is coming. Look, after the Second World War came a boom. After the First World War came a boom. After this COVID, which is, in my own view, as good as a war, or if you like, as bad as a world war, okay, only that this was an health issue. Uh, however, the shutdowns we saw, uh, the close downs, the lockdowns, it was, it was something so odd that most people will probably just want to have that maybe maximum once in a lifetime. I probably don't want, I don't want to go through that lockdown uh, again because it was mind bending. And of course, shipping ground to a halt, international trade collapsed, you know. SMEs collapse. In fact, most of them have not been able to recover. However, there's a boom coming because people will have to play catch up. Everything they miss during the lockdown, they will have to play catch up. Whatever it is you are selling, there's a chance that people are going to come back to you and say, look, okay, now I want to enjoy those same things that I used to enjoy. Uh, so we can actually position for that boom. And of course, as the boom comes, so also should the books of the banks be uh, tidied up. Uh, uh, the, only dif the only problem they may have will be in discipline, okay? You see now, the moral hazard factor, the fact that, you know, when we have, look, I say to people, and, and it's of course the truth, under what they call the um, reserve banking system, banks are the ones that create money, okay? Banks are the ones that create money, not the central bank per se. It, a banking license is a license to print money, so to speak. If you start a bank today with 1,000 Naira, and you start to cre you can create a loan of 1500 and you have created 500 naira that you don't have and you can either backstop that by going to the central bank or by by borrowing from your other banks before you know it the entire industry is booming however when, in spite of the opportunity that people have to make so much money stable money regulated money and all of that you know many times they still trip quote and unquote the trip and people just become very undisciplined and directors of banks and other, some other companies like that, especially banks, they resume daily just to, and with one agenda. Let us ruin this bank. I've never been able to understand it. And of course, we're saying that quite a number of banks have died in the past before even the central bank took this position. And not only Nigerian central bank, most central banks around the world took this position that some banks were too big to fail. And in fact, it's the reason why cryptocurrencies emerged. Because cryptocurrencies were people, the, the proponents of it believe that, look, this is a fraudulent scenario. Why would central banks bail out these banks and use taxpayers' money to bail them out? Why would they not sanction the people who run the banks aground and so on? So, I mean, it's a long thing, it's a long story uh, that connects to a number of factors. So, but if we can remove the indiscipline, and I think what the sanctioning of this big bank uh, can do also is to get everybody to sit up and say, hey, if I'm not doing well, these guys can take us out easily. Uh, I mean, they, I mean, no. I mean, there was a scenario where the central bank governor said he called the chairman of that uh, holding company and uh, a couple of times and you, you were telling him that you're not going to do what a, a bank that is actually surviving on the on the on the on the um, on the uh, on the mercy of, of, of the central bank. You say you're bigger than the, the regulator. No, you're joking. OK, whereas I don't have the full details. But if that's the case and the director becomes or a chairman becomes a calcitrant, uh, a, a lesson has been made. And the other bank directors and chairmen should understand that no matter how big they get, no matter how connected, the central bank as a regulator will be still going to do its job. Because eventually, if everything tumbles over, okay, of course, all of us will go and blame the central bank and say, you haven't done your job well. Look, why did you make us stranded? Imagine if 31 million customers couldn't access their money. And remember, those 31 million, most of them are very conservative people, people who believe that because this bank has been around since 1894, it's the first bank in Nigeria, it's a stable bank, it's not a cowboy bank like some will say, quote and unquote, you know, then I will put everything I have. Generational money is in that bank, okay? So I think it's very, very important. So I believe that um, uh, other banks should take the cue and uh, everybody will begin to arrange their books properly going forward. It's a good way to leave it, but someone sent a message, and I want to ask you. You talked about regulation and deregulation. The president now said, uh, what do you make of deregulation of the downstream? We like your reaction to that. Let's move away from banking now. What do you make of that? So, uh, fact, you, see, you, see, uh, you know, this is a, that is a whole different ballgame entirely, <laughs> Tony. I mean, we, we, we were told, we, how many times have they told us they deregulated the downstream? When they, the, the next thing is, maybe 
the price of crude oil goes up, and then the, the, the NFPC comes and makes a statement of PPPRA and say, uh, we are setting the price. And no, I said, why would, you, why would PPPRA be setting price in a deregulated market? The day that that market will be deregulated, a few things will happen. Number one, organizations like PPPRA and co will disappear because you cannot set price in a deregulated market. Okay? Number two is that, you know, even the price of, 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 of petrol in Agege will be different from uh, the price of petrol in Victoria Island. In fact, you'll be able to sell higher in Victoria Island because you are reckoning that oh, the guys that live here, they, they can afford it, even if it's one naira or two naira or three naira different. You know, so if, um, it's, so, it's so saddening and, of course, unfortunate that this last time we had a, 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 a quite a, a substantial review of the price upward, and they said, now we have the regulator. But look at it now. NFC is now saying that, look, 111 billion, 112 billion is sitting somewhere that they cannot recover, and therefore they are not going to be able to post anything to uh, FAC this month because they, they, they are now sitting on huge amounts of, of, of subsidy. So, you see, the Nigerian government should bite the bullet. There's no point. Look, you could as well be subsidizing uh, uh, palm oil. I did an analysis at some point on this same issue. Palm oil is a lot more expensive than, 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 than petrol, and more people use palm oil in this, especially those in the villages. Who is subsidizing palm oil? Must you subsidize anything? And must we subsidize petroleum? So I think, I don't know where we got into our head that petrol must be subsidized. And to, uh, to what extent? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so, uh, so nobody should be talking about deregulation of downstream because it has not been deregulated. If the day is deregulated, we'll stop hearing about subsidies hanging somewhere or they call it under recovery, over recovery, whatever it is, nomenclature that it comes out with. So that's my position on that. The day we deregulate, we can have that discussion. Chief Executive Officer, Global Analytics Consulting, former presidential candidate, uh, NRP, Mr. Tokwe Fashwa. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate this. Go back to your meeting. Okay. <laughs>